today we are on which page? Aha. We're on page 120. Great. I'm glad my own co hosts are reminding me where we've got to. <laughs> And we're recording now, so we're about to begin the session. So as usual, we're reading from this wonderful book, Social and Communal Harmony, which is the overriding theme of the suttas that are here. And uh, today it's very nice. We move from the seven, what was it, conditions for social harmony and the seven conditions for monastic harmony to attending on the sick, which is very interesting and I think highlights the importance of compassion. And also, to some extent, the Buddha's immense wisdom and the way that his teachings would um, be transferable to every aspect of life, right? Not only to looking after one another in the society at large or in the monasteries, but also to the importance he placed on looking after people when they're sick as well. And it's quite beautiful here to notice how um, much detail he goes into around not only the qualities of a good patient, but the qualities of a good attendant foremost um yeah and how to be a good patient to make it easier for others to care for you so and of course this links in partly to uh to the wisdom that we develop through our practice of meditation so i shall begin and uh, for anybody who hasn't been to these sort of classes before i'm not sure about beer if you've been uh are you new beer to this sort of class Anyway, for the benefit of those who are, actually, there's one in the room, <laughs> our very dear friend Richard. Um, this is more of a discussion than me giving all the answers, which I don't have. <laughs> uh, so do please ask questions or <clears throat> feel free to give your understanding or application of this, how it might apply to your lives, any insights you have um as we go through so you can do that by either raising your virtual hand or i will also prompt questions at certain places along the way and it's really nice when we can hear from other people so that we get a perspective on how broad and how applicable these teachings are to everybody's life so here we go it's uh this is from the anger to a fives number one two three so that's easy to remember and it's called Attending on the Sick. And as usual, I'm going to change the language to be gender inclusive. <laughs> so here I'll say monastics, but of course this in, is applicable to anybody, uh, whether monastic or lay. Monastics possessing five qualities, an attendant is qualified to take care of a patient. What five? Number one, one is able to prepare medicine. Number two, one knows what is beneficial and harmful so that one withholds what is harmful and offers what is beneficial. Number three, one takes care of the patient with a mind of loving kindness, not for the sake of material rewards. Number four, one is not disgusted at having to remove feces, urine, vomit, or spittle. And number five, one is able from time to time to instruct, encourage, inspire, and gladden the patient with a Dhamma talk. Possessing these five qualities, an attendant is qualified to take care of a patient. I don't know if any of you here are carers maybe in your professional work or perhaps for someone at home or a friend a parent even a child but uh, perhaps you can relate to some of this perhaps you've not thought about the inspiration or rousing a person with a dhamma talk but who knows you know sometimes when we're sick that's when we really need to dig a bit deeper isn't it and to find new ways of being able to relate to the sickness and, and actually glean some wisdom from that experience so I'll carry on, but we can go into this in detail. And this is a reciprocal, so how the patient can then um, be easy to take care of. So possessing five other qualities, a patient is easy to take care of. What five? 
one does what is beneficial. One observes moderation in what is beneficial. One takes their medicine. <laughs> one accurately discloses one's symptoms to their kind-hearted attendant. They report, as fits the case, that their condition is getting worse or getting better or remaining the same. And one can patiently endure arisen bodily feelings that are painful, racking, sharp, piercing, harrowing, disagreeable, and sapping one's vitality. Possessing these five qualities, a patient is easy to take care of. So I find this very interesting, and I don't know about other people, but uh, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that we're also talking here about how the patient can be easy to take care of and in that way support the attendant. And uh, it's interesting because at the moment I'm uh, thinking of going to India for some Ayurvedic treatment. And if I go there, I go to this very traditional hospital uh, where they ask you to actually stay put in the place for about two or three weeks, depending on how long uh, they decide you need to recover and for them to do the treatment and actually uh, get the most benefit from the treatment. And one of the things I ask actually is, of course, that you take your medicine um, and also that you kind of stay inside. You don't go around and sort of go walking in the town and even do internet too much, but you actually take it as an opportunity to have a lot of rest and recuperation and just focus on the healing process. And you can see how that would be very helpful to those attending, right? Especially if they're attending on a person with a mind of loving kindness, you know, trying to do their best for you and offer you the right medicines. But then if you don't take the medicine, their efforts become kind of futile. And I think it's quite interesting here from, again, an Ayurvedic perspective, because I studied Indian medicine um, at degree level before I became a bhikkhuni or before I took bhikkhuni ordination. And uh, it's interesting to me that it says one observes moderation in what is beneficial. Because sometimes we think we have to be moderate with those things that are not so beneficial. But if it's beneficial, we can have as much as we want, right? even if it's something so-called healthy. But actually in Indian medicine, anything that's taken in excess or even taken too little of is considered um, not so healthy, you know, quite detrimental sometimes. So there's always that idea of moderation in everything, even that that's beneficial. Um, yeah, and accurately disclosing symptoms to the kind-hearted attendant and being honest as fits the case that the condition's getting worse or better or remaining the same so that they can apply the appropriate remedy. And I kind of like the last one because I think this is very important in meditation practice that we learn to endure those bodily feelings that are difficult, that are uncomfortable, unpleasant. And uh, in some translations, <clears throat> it actually says menacing to life. So of course, these are the kind of... Uh, sensations feelings in the body that we're all going to experience at some point and at that time you know we need to have had some practice so sometimes you know we can take the path a little bit too easy especially when we're practicing samadhi I know some teachers who encourage you to kind of always be comfortable no matter what and if you're not comfortable don't even bother trying to meditate because it'll be really hard to meditate and get into deep samadhi but I think something's really missing there because unless we actually learn to be able to um, develop the wise attitude and attitude of kindness and um, compassion, patience with these difficult feelings, then how are we going to endure, you know, old age, disease and, and the dying process? It's going to be really very difficult. So if we need perfect conditions to get enlightened, I mean, basically, we need to be in the Deva realm, you know, but the human realm has kind of a fair share of both suffering and happiness. And I think for that reason, the Buddha said it was one of the most beneficial places to actually practice, uh, where there's the most chance of really making progress on the path. So without trying to, you know, bring about difficult feelings in the body by sitting on your knees <laughs> when the nuns are giving the blessing chant, you know, if you can find comfort, great, go ahead. But if you're stuck, if your back's against the wall, it's important to know how to be able to uh, handle those feelings um, and really handle the mind that reacts, isn't it? 
because sometimes we can't um, alleviate the physical pain. So it's very interesting that it talks about the ideal patient. Yeah. So anyway, I didn't say too much about the first part, but I really like to open to um, comments and uh, input from the group because I guess this is quite instructive for all of us. And uh, I don't know if anybody here has had experience looking after people who are sick, or I guess most people will have to some extent, if you would like to share anything or how this might relate. I think Susie has her hand up. If you do find your virtual hand down below on the buttons, it's even more helpful for our co-hosts. So we can, there we go. Uh, so Susie, may I ask you to unmute, please? Hi. Um, hello. hello. Hi. Um, so what came to mind wasn't just humans, it was like animals as well. Mm. Um, because I, I, I have personal experience looking after animals and I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm not being offensive. Oh, goodness. Um, animals are also like beings we look after as well. Like, of course, because like veterinary care and I was, I was going to go into veterinary care, um, actually when I left college. Um, so one of the first things that came to my mind was like cleaning up after them yeah. and administering <laughs> medicine but what came what like also related to it was like um having difficulty look, look like giving the medicine to them because I worked at a kennel once and um I tried to give this medicine to a dog with, with a slice of ham and it wouldn't eat the eat the medicine it would eat the ham only the ham <laughs> yeah so yeah, that's what I wanted to add. <laughs> so uh, okay. can be difficult. So yes, yeah, some patients can be difficult. Absolutely, yes. And I think that's why I hear it says that one takes care of the patient with a mind of loving kindness, not for the sake of material rewards. And at first when I read that, I thought, okay, so that's not for money, that's not for getting rich, you know, because then there's a lot of corruption that can come into the kind of healthcare industry. But maybe one of the rewards that we might be seeking is that the patient gets better, you know. And sometimes that's a, an actual corruption of loving kindness. We give loving kindness in order that someone else feels better. But the Buddha actually teaches that we give loving kindness to purify our mind of aversion and to develop that beautiful quality of unconditional love, which means you love that being, whether a human or an animal, whether or not they get better, whether or not they respond, even, even whether or not they take their medicine, I think. So it involves patience. And I think patience is a really important aspect of true loving kindness. You know, the Buddha says that um, loving kindness is like a mother who protects with her life, her only child, only, only. It's best to all living beings, not only one's own child. And that's the difference between a mother's love and a real loving kindness. It's not only to their child, but it's as to their child, to all beings. So that patience is immense. You know, because we don't like all beings, all beings aren't going to behave the way we want them to. And um, one of our dear supporters who's sitting here now uh, actually told this very beautiful story about patients when looking after others. And uh, he's working in a, a respite center where people come in with all kinds of uh, physical and mental disabilities, so to speak, or um, what can we say, mental, not the norm, <laughs> I don't want to say illnesses really but you know people who are struggling and who need some care some respite away from either their usual place where they live or maybe um, usual facility where they live and he said that sometimes it's really taught him patience because sometimes he has to sit with a patient for a whole hour before they will eat a spoon of food and they have to continue to look after this person and be with them and encourage them and develop that loving kindness until they finish the meal. Imagine that, you know, if you had to wait a whole hour, maybe for the dog <laughs> to eat the medicine and not only the ham, <laughs> you know, or maybe several days, I don't know. Um, but you can see it as a practice in patients. So, yeah, it's not always going to work, but we can still purify our minds, I guess. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> Thanks for that. It's really nice to um, hear that applied to animals. I don't know about the um, instructing and gladdening one with a dumber talk. That might not refer to animals, but who knows what, what animals can understand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Susie. Did you, uh, Richard have his hand up at some point? Did you? Yeah. Yeah, Richard. Now. I nearly sneezed. <laughs> Richard, are you there? We can't hear you, Richard. Uh, Richard, uh, may I ask you to unmute, please? Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, okay. Hi, right, sorry about that. Um, Yes, I mean, myself, I actually, you know, I've got two friends of mine, you know, it's a friend of mine called um, Redwood, you know, uh, I mean, he's currently in a, in a care home up in North London, I've known him mm. for about 20 years, and in the past he was very helpful to me because I was homeless, and um, I've known this guy for about 20 years, so, you know, I've been helping him out because he's, he's in, a, in the care home at the moment, but he's the sort of managed to press the schizophrenic. Mm. You know, and he's very, very lonely, and he, um, you know, and, and um, you know, he finds it very hard to cope with his emotional states. So, because I'm his friend, I go to visit him with another friend of mine. You know, we just simply go there, just simply to be with him for only for about an hour. Mm. You know, and we just sit there and we just read to him. You know, at the moment reading a book to him, and um, just simply do that. Just simply be in a room with him for an hour with the right intentions, really nice. And I have another friend of mine as well, this lady who is, who's also, you know, she's also in a, um, at the moment she's in a mental hospital. Mm -hmm. She's had a, 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 you know, another breakdown. She has a sort of condition, reoccurring condition caused by medication to sort of, I don't know, put out a calm, I suppose. You know, so I am, um, so I'm a family friend. I you know, help out by taking cigarettes to her. So <laughs> I literally, just literally, I know. So I go all the way over and I just literally take her a packet of cigarettes as a gift, you know, because I'm her friend. And um, it can be a real, you know, I'm going to put this politely, um, it can be a real, um, it's a very good way to practice patience, put it that mm -hmm. way, without blowing mm -hmm. my top, you know. <laughs> and vice versa, you know, but um, yeah, it's very good because it's um, very good practice and uh, it's very appreciated both ways because it helps yeah. me to practice as well, Great. you know, to, to give of myself. Yeah. So I appreciate it. Oh, that's myself wonderful. As well. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I also learned that um, through that, I have to pace myself as well. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to get burnt out. Yeah. Because I found that in myself, because my friend, the first one, he's he has a real, a reoccurring cycle of doing the same thing. You know, he he basically doesn't really understand or don't want to understand that he he gets into a cycle where he gets stuck. Yeah. And so he expects everybody to help him out, and um, that can be very very tiring for everybody else to deal right. with. Yeah. So that's the problem with that. So we have to be very skillful with him. And this is a guy like in his 80s and he's almost like a child. Yeah. In yeah, some yeah. instances. But it's, um, so it's very good practice. Yeah, wonderful. You know, both, both ways. Great. That's wonderful. Yeah, I love the way you're speaking about it as, you know, having benefits of practice as the reward rather than anything yeah, it's very good yeah. even you know good feeling you might get because you have to endure isn't yeah, it? Because, yeah because it was done on the and uh because it's, a, it's an it's an act of giving yeah basically. good good well, wonderful wisdom as well thank you for sharing that's well thank you thank you very well thank you very much <laughs> you're welcome May I ask uh, Mukund, may I ask you to unmute, please? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's uh, so my mother is 80, uh, and she is now, uh, you know, 
deeply into dementia. She's or Alzheimer's, whatever. She's like, she will say something, do something, and literally one minute later would not know she's done it. So it's um, she's actually you know, like in a senior home with my brothers, so not like in, put away in a care home. And uh, I have so he's in India, I'm in India as well, but in a different city. Uh, he's actually uh, he's actually at a going car retreat right now. Uh, in River. He's just gets back from Nigapuri tomorrow. Um, yeah, so so I I've been here for the last you know, like uh, 10, 12 days while he's been away, and uh, I have a brother in the US and. Actually, my brothers are uh, make me feel great because my brother in the US will say, I'll come and stay for a month if required. He actually did a month's retreat last time, last year. So he, he was here for a full month and I, I came for a little bit in between. And uh, of course, he's staying with my, she's staying with my brother. Uh, but it's uh, it's very difficult. It's also very interesting. Like, you know, I was a bit surprised that uh, we actually have my uncles, her brothers, basically saying, you know, she should be put in a care home, which essentially means that we need family with her, which is, uh, you know, both my brothers and I are extremely uncomfortable with that. Uh, but at the same time, it's, uh, it is super <laughs> difficult. I mean, in this last 10 days I've been here, I'm working as well. And it's almost impossible to work with the door to be open because, you know, she'll just walk in every few minutes with the same thing, whatever. And I feel very bad about blocking the door. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a it's a difficult thing, and I think it's you know it's it goes beyond uh, what should I say? You know, general meta and general patients. This is really about you know. I, I guess at some levels I'm saying I need to know my limits. I need to know when yeah. I need to lock the door because I'm not going to be able to handle the situation well. And of course, you know. And other times, knowing when to be patient. There was a time when I used to worry about, you know, I'm not really answering that question truthfully. And now I'm like, that's okay. I have to answer based on what she can understand. And she can't understand mm -hmm. anything that's more than a one sentence answer. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. any complicated question will not get an actual answer. Right, right. So she will constantly ask me, can I come back to Delhi with you? And I always tell her yes, knowing that it's never going to happen, but she just can't do it. Yeah. So yeah, that's... Go. Yeah, it's almost like the um, intention overrides the words, right? <laughs> like the intention of compassion and, you know, putting a person's mind at ease is more important at that moment than literal truth because that's not what she's understanding anyway. So in that sense, you know, it's not exactly a lie, I would say. I mean, there's very few cases where it's encouraged or, you know, it's not going to create some kind of uh, inner conflict. But I think in that case, it's quite wise to put the general kind of uh, patient's well-being first you know um, so that, that's really skillful and I mean it is probably a little bit encouraging to notice that in this sutta it does also talk about the qualities that make a patient easy to care for right so it's not yes. actually saying in, encouraging you necessarily it's recognizing that it's helpful if the patient's easy to care for <laughs> that it works yeah. both ways you know so yeah who knows what the buddha would say in that situation i think he would definitely encourage that you do take the time to practice meditation to re-resource yourself you know and to develop that self-compassion and acknowledgement of your limitations how far you can really help um uh, yeah your point about uh, you know being uh, you know, be compassionate to the person versus necessarily being, uh, you know, absolutely honest, I think is, is, is really resonates, right? Because, yeah, I mean, telling her, no, you can't come with me or you can never come with me is true and not helpful. And it doesn't matter right. what I say because she's going to forget in a few minutes and repeat afterwards anyway. And in a way, yeah. you're answering to someone who's not in the reality anyway, right? She's she's in her own reality. So in a way, it's a kind of it's a kind of theoretical conversation, isn't it? It's a kind yes. of playing along with a little bit of fantasy in a way. Yeah, yeah. And I, I yes, I actually did notice this point about the patient's responsibilities because yeah, sometimes I feel like telling her, look, you know. It'd be helpful if you're a little patient and you don't get angry and you're like, there is a helper around this. But sometimes I'm like, you, know, mm. you really should be a little bit more kind to them because, you know, just because something is placed one foot away from where it should be, 
is not a reason to get upset. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, well done, though. I think you deserve a lot of, yeah. Credit well, I'm not doing most of it. I'm just filling in at times. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you are developing enormous uh, qualities with that because it's difficult. And the more difficult a situation, the more scope for developing ourselves there can be as long as we know when, you know, the limit really of our yeah, yeah. And, and have you that know, to ourselves. I'm going to try really, to move on a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has a question before we come back to Susie, just to give everyone a chance. Uh, so anyone else? Otherwise, I'll come to Susie. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to add, um, it's so brave how everyone's coming out with um like so so many like tough stories. It's it's very reflective of how Samsara is quite a difficult place. Mm. Um, because I I didn't um I didn't met, I didn't meet many people who struggle with so so many difficult things, and we didn't talk about it. It's, it's like a it's like a thing that's sort of like a, a stigma to talk about, and um, you are so brave to talk about like um, stuff like schizophrenia and dementia. It's like it's all part of our lives. Right. So those people who care for those people who care for um, people. Um, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's kind. Especially your loving kindness. That's a that is a big part of it mm -hmm. because loving kindness is such a, a positive influence on a lot of people's minds. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Linda. Hi, I'll just I'll just speak briefly, I'll lower my hand, I'll just speak briefly. I hear about limitations and, and about difficult patients. I worked as a carer and I found my difficulties, my lack of patience, my fear would be with people with aggressive dementia mm -hmm. and a, aggressive um, intellectual disabilities and I enjoyed working with enjoyed <laughs> I enjoyed working with people who were probably the end of life right 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 yeah and that's fair enough we're not all cut out for the same things you know <laughs> I mean I think we need credit when we even try I mean how many people you know, would even consider um, caring as a livelihood. You know, you can make more money in a simpler job <laughs> that doesn't involve so much, uh, so much of a challenge to oneself. So I think it's really laudable and really beautiful when people make that choice. It doesn't matter how long we do it for, you know. It's, uh, it's just the fact that we tried. So I think that's, yeah. And sometimes we have to find our strengths because, you know, part of this sutta is about putting your efforts where it's going to yield the most fruit, right? Where the patient is responsive, they do take their medicine, et cetera, right? You could apply that to sort of being able, yeah, really being amenable to the help. And uh, maybe sometimes it's better to put our energies where we know we can have a direct benefit. And there might be other people that are more qualified to, to uh, work with others you know so I mean I certainly see my life that way that I try to put my energies into things where I know that it can have a lot of impact you know uh, even though it's difficult and sometimes I need to take time out for myself and sometimes the conditions aren't there to make something come about you know say a bikuni monastery or starting to train other nuns I'd love to do that straight away but you know as long as there aren't enough conditions there isn't enough support or help with admin or other bikunis to sort of you know being more balanced to the training and uh then the conditions aren't there so the best thing I can do sometimes is go on retreat develop myself in Dhamma and trust that you know when when there's enough support then we can move it forward so yeah I think that's uh perfectly okay <laughs> yeah okay 
So I'm going to carry on. Are there any more comments or questions on this um, particular sutta, first of all, or shall we get on to the next one? Which moves into quite a different area. Shall we continue? All right. I'll come to the uh, question in the box later on. So the next one is from the Anguttara Apes, Anguttara Apes, called Caste is Irrelevant. Isn't that nice? <laughs> we could extend that to gender is irrelevant, <laughs> all kinds of things. I mean, they're not irrelevant so long as they impact our lives, but I think the point here is that um, the Buddha is speaking of inclusivity. So, merging like the rivers in the ocean is the first subsection. Just as when the great rivers, the Ganges, the Yamuna, the Achiravati, the Sarabhu and the Mahi reach the great ocean, they give up their former names and designations and are simply called the great ocean. So too, when members of the four castes, Katyas, Brahmins, Vesas and Suttas, go forth from the household life into homelessness in the Dhamma and discipline, proclaimed by the Tathagata, that's the Buddha. They give up their former names and clans and are simply called ascetics following the Sakyan San. <laughs> so, that's quite lovely, isn't it? that we give up that kind of designation that differentiates ourselves, especially in terms of ranking <laughs> one greater than another or above another. And in this case, I mean, the castes weren't necessarily always seen as one being superior to the other, but just the fact that there are these different worldly kind of livelihoods or roles that we play. Once we come to the, the Buddha's dispensation and actually renounce our hair, <laughs> our clothing, our status, and all of that, it really makes no sense to continue to refer to ourselves that way. I have to admit, I find it strange, <laughs> and this is nothing against any individual, and there might be reasons for this, but I do find it strange when some monastics use the word doctor venerable such and such, you know, as if the fact that they're a doctor in something is still important, because actually at that point, you're just a member of the Sangha, right? You're not practicing as a doctor, it doesn't really matter how much you've learned, it's all about the qualities you develop in your heart, it's about Surrendering, surrendering yourself to the training um, and actually yeah coming out of that identity view so I really like that and simply called ascetics following the Sakyan son I mean that was the Buddha he was a Sakyan um, which is kind of ironic actually to me that it says that here where it's saying we give off our clan <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I prefer to think of him as just the, the Buddha, but I guess they're, you know, they're just referring to him here. But I like the idea that we're simply called ascetics rather than, you know, uh, actually even monastics. But I never like to refer my, to myself very much as a bhikkhuni or as having become a bhikkhuni or people wanting to become monks and nuns. Um, because we're not actually trying to become anything. We're actually giving up a lot. And we might be taking a particular ordination, a particular system of training, but that doesn't make us any different as human beings to anyone else. You know, we're just, um, we're just willingly um, surrendering ourselves in a way or uh, making ourselves amenable to the training. So I think it's so important not to think of monastic life as an escape either. And, you know, oh, I don't like being a lay person. I want to be a nun. I want to be, you know, maybe an ajahn or, or all these different titles that we can start to bring into monastic life. But just to consider ourselves as ascetics, you know, people who've given up our status, our wealth and all those things that kind of define us in the world. Because um, we carry enough of that internally, right? <laughs> Um, the last thing we want to do is uh, carry it with names and labels as well. And I really like the be bit about merging into the great ocean, you know, we just come together. And I think that's one of the things when you are in a Buddhist country or a big monastery, everybody looks the same. So when you go for arms round, you just come together wearing the same clothes, you know, maybe different colours, different genders, if you're lucky to be in a dual sangha or if a monastery sometimes welcomes monks or nuns uh, so they're both together there 
it's really beautiful because you don't really know kind of who's great at meditation or who's a sutta expert. You're basically just uh, in order of who went forth first. So you're respecting the commitment, you're respecting the uh, years of training that somebody has, not any individual. So someone's saying, this makes me think of the teachings on the three conceits, which seem to be a very deep teaching. Since, since it was how some monastics declared arahatship to the Buddha. Yeah. So there's three conceits that I am better, I am worse, and even I am the same or I am equal. And uh, these are very refined forms of conceit that basically uh, people have right until they're fully enlightened. Even the anagami, I think, can have that mana. It's called asmi mana, like the conceit of I am anything, right? So still the idea that there's something e even equal <laughs> is a kind of conceit because the point is that there's actually nothing there that you can really put any label on. It's the process. How can a process be equal to another process or the same or different? I mean, it's just a process. It's cause and effect. So yeah, some, sometimes the um, monastics would go to the Buddha and basically say that they didn't think they never kind of conceive that I am better, I'm worse, I'm the same. They don't conceive that way anymore. And then the Buddha would know that they'd um, put down all identity view, even in thought and perception, not only the view, but the whole way of conceiving. So, yeah, that's true. And obviously, this is the very beginning, isn't it, when we still differentiate ourselves in terms of things like caste or class or educational background, etc. Not to say that sometimes in monasteries, um, there aren't differences or there aren't people with certain strengths that um, we can actually uh, kind of, uh, what do you say, sort of hone or uh, utilize for the sake of furthering the Dhamma, right? Some people will be good at one thing, some at another, but it doesn't mean the person who just sweeps the monastery is any less worthy of respect than the person who, you know, leads the sutta class. <laughs> and sometimes we can trade places as well. So that's really important in monastic life that we all have a go at a bit of everything. Yeah, I always like it when I have the chance to do a bit of washing up or, I don't know, make some tea with some herbs or something because I'm not allowed to cook, but I can still make a nice lemon and ginger, uh, whatever, <laughs> water on the stove. And it's it's great. I love that. You know, it's, uh, it's sometimes weird being a monastic when you're not allowed to do anything for yourself. Because, uh, yeah, sometimes you feel that some of these really senior kind of, usually monks, because there aren't so many senior bhikkhunis, but usually monks in some cultures, some traditions become almost like royalty, you know. <laughs> and it's dangerous. It's actually dangerous if you think now I am a such and such, a Ajahn Ajahn Ajahn, or whatever, most venerable, venerable Maha Ajahn <laughs> that ever existed. So, yeah, we have to be careful of that. <laughs> um, did Mukund have something again? Mukund? No. Uh, I wonder if anyone in the room has something to offer or add about anything so far. Do you want to say anything, Venerable Upeka? I'm sure you have lots of things to add and people would love to hear from you. If you speak loudly, louder. Hang on. Where's your, oh, there she is. Hang on, hang on. There you are. All right. There you are. Okay. Well, I was thinking about- Can you hear? About the, uh, being a, a patient and being, uh, looking after a sick person. And I remember uh, an analogy Ajahn Suchito made in a talk that I was, well, actually a book I was reading. But, um, you know, when we treat ourselves, when we treat our, our own little minds, we, um, it's like it, we treat, to treat ourselves like a, a patient as opposed to how we usually treat ourselves, which is just telling ourselves to do this and to do that. But, you know, when you look after a patient, you you see, are they okay? You know, they're feeling grumpy today. What can I do? Um, can I fix the bed? Oh, dear, you know, um, uh, uh, do they need anything? Do they need any medicine? And to treat our, treat our 
ourselves, our minds, like we treat a patient that is sick because actually we are sick. Um, uh, but yeah, but to have to have that attitude of looking after a patient when we are look we are look we are sitting down to meditate really when we look at look at ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I I find that very useful. I find that very useful. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, but, uh, thank you. That's really great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we were saying earlier, you know, with a patient, if you could see your mind as a patient, you wouldn't say, right, mind, come on, get up. Don't do that. Turn over. Take your medicine. <laughs> we wouldn't do that, would we? I mean, I hope we wouldn't because we get fired from our job as a carer, that's for sure. <laughs> so, you know, but we do it with our mind. We're like, come on, get up. You're meant to meditate. You only meditated half an hour. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Take your medicine. Watch your breath, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Venerable Baker. Okay. And someone else says, in Chinese, we call all monastics ones who've left home, which sounds beautiful to me too. Yeah, one who, ones who've left home. That's lovely. And um, what does bhikkhu and bhikkhuni mean? It does mean that, right? It means like, a, does it mean arms mendicant? Yeah. yeah. It means a beggar. It means a beggar. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, one who have left home, in Theravada, we call anagarikas. That's like a, a homeless one, or one who's left one who's left the home. Because there's a difference being homeless and being an anagarika. Some people are homeless; they don't have a choice. They don't have a roof, right? That's what we think of as homeless in our society. So anagarikas still usually, hopefully, have a roof. And in ancient Indian culture, if they didn't, then they'd be probably quite lucky to be offered one anyway in a village of some supporter. So, yeah. Someone else is saying even the Buddha had the physician, Jivaka, absolutely. And uh, even the Buddha, well, of course, the Buddha, because sometimes we think that if we're enlightened, we're not going to get sick. Or sometimes people say, you know, I hope your meditation practice improves to the point where you'll get better. And honestly, I mean, that helps the mind, but it isn't going to necessarily help conditions that are caused by something external. So just harking back to my Ayurvedic training, we had two types of conditions. Some were kind of internal, which were produced by the humors of the body. Actually, it's not humors, really. It's the functions of the body internally, say the elements, miss uh, kind of an imbalance in the elements. But some are called agantuja, which means they come from outside. And that's things like parasites, bacteria, whatever. This is nothing to do with our mental state, right? Unless you could say it's caused by ignorance, delusion, taking the wrong food, drinking the wrong water. It could sometimes be a little bit of miscalculation. But basically, like these things are physical issues that need a physical cause. And of course, you know, depending on the state of mind, we'll suffer more or less. Uh, we can do a whole load of uh, we can improve things a lot by our attitude. But if you already have a really positive attitude, it's not necessarily going to well, it's not enough to actually cure uh, disease if that were the case the buddha wouldn't have died and they also say you know ajahn brahm always says this is his excuse oh well if jinxing worked or the chinese people all die so jinxing's not the miracle drug you know so yeah we have to be realistic i mean that's what led the buddha to uh, renounce the world isn't it and to wander forth as a homeless one he um saw the uh, old person, maybe male, the sick person, the dead person, and then the ascetic. So it was like, I don't know, I love that order. You see the dead person, and then you see, oh, there's an ascetic. Maybe they're seeking the way out of birth and death. And that was actually one of the definitions of dukkha. It's birth, aging, and death. It's pretty radical, pretty simple, so you can overlook it, but it's pretty radical because these are the things we cannot avoid, right? Once you've got your birth and you're living your happy life you can make it pretty nice for a while <laughs> you can have the like exemplary life or you can have the kind of very comfortable very meaningful life but still you're not going to escape that sickness and death so yeah the buddha did have a physician and i think he was also ayurvedic ayurvedic doesn't mean some kind of hocus pocus it just means uh, the science of life so finding a medical system that's really looking at causes causality yeah. So bhiksha is what you beg for in Sanskrit. Interesting. Even in Hindi today, the word for to beg is bhik. B-H-E. 
E K. So like E. Yeah. Wow. Is what you beg for, Biksha? Like you actually get Biksha, or you are a Biksha? I'm not sure. Today the word for to beg is beak. Very interesting. Yeah, I'll just check in with you. Yeah, so in, in Sanskrit, you know, like uh, the I guess the Brahmanical equivalent of uh, uh, I guess a novice, you know, is you you actually you're supposed to go through a period of of training when you go away to the forest. You know, one of the stages of life. So when you beg, you say, you know, if it's a lady, you say Bhavati, Bhiksham, Dehi, and Bhiksham, or uh, Bhiksha is what you're begging for. So you know, it's, it's right. you're begging for food. So, okay. so, so, so there's a connection between Bhiksha Bhika, and, and, and Bhiku. Uh, there's a slight difference between Sanskrit and Pali in terms of how yeah. these words yeah. are pronounced. Right. So it certainly wasn't a status thing, right? Because a beggar is like the lowest of the low <laughs> in most cultures the one who begs is like not somebody but there's a but there's a lot of respect for uh okay. for the sure. seven eras in general right so absolutely uh, so in that sense it is not derogatory at all it's not derogatory, absolutely, but it's respect because they actually have gone forth and given something up rather than respect because they've become something or because yes. they you know they have a status um yeah and it's only really respected i think in those cultures which have that understanding i mean over here it's you know as a western monastic you're usually kind of at least people's families at first think well what have they done they've given up a really good degree and a possible career and that's embarrassing you know to tell their friends about that it's like she's just like loafing around and you know asking for things from people and <laughs> actually my parents never thought too much like that but i know people who do have parents who it's very challenging for yeah very challenging in western non-buddhist countries yeah but i receive respect in india as well i have been there actually as a non not as a oh as a bikuni too but even as a burmese non i um people would come up to me in the street and just suddenly say can we offer you lunch it was fantastic i was quite impressed because they didn't really care if i was a buddhist or what i was they just saw the robe and they were like oh mahatma ji <laughs> or like sadhu ji or something <laughs> it was really sweet mm. yeah renunciation is respected in india actually regardless of uh, religion i would say it's a fantastic culture so so vibrant and uh, rich <laughs> All right. So anything else on that point about uh, the cast and the coming together of many people in harmony? Anything else we can learn from that in our societies? Anything, anything going, going, and we go on. So the next one's also quite short. And this also comes under the caste subject. So all can realize the highest goal. So that's what's really important. Suppose there were a pond with clear, agreeable, cool water, transparent, with smooth banks, delightful. If a person scorched and exhausted by hot weather, weary, parched and thirsty, came from the east or from the west or from the north or from the south or from where you will. Having reached the pond, they would quench their thirst and their hot weather fever. So too, if anyone from a clan of Katyas goes forth from the home life into homelessness or from a clan of Brahmins or a clan of Vaisas or a clan of Suttas, and after encountering the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata, they develop loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy and equanimity, and thereby gain internal peace. Then because of that internal peace, they practice the way proper to the ascetic, I say. Hmm. Monastics, if anyone from a clan of Katyas goes forth from the home life into homelessness, or from a clan of Brahmins, or a clan of Vaisas, or a clan of Suttas, and by realizing it for themselves with direct knowledge that they here and now enter upon and abide in the liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom that is influx free, 
through the destruction of the influxes, that's the asawas, then they're an ascetic because of the destruction of the influxes. And that's from Majimani Kaya 40, which I'm not sure of the uh, name of that sutta. If anybody has a name, that'd be interesting. And the page for Diana is now page uh, 121 to 122. Yeah, you have it written there. Great. Yeah. So this is what makes you truly an ascetic. Not just the robe, not just the begging, <laughs> not just the going forth and leaving the household life. So, but it's step by step, isn't it? It's the gradual training again, which is one of the main themes in the suttas from start to finish. There's a gradual training and we do each step according to our capacity at that time and according to how it may further our practice. So it's not for everybody to ordain, to renounce the world and to go forth, but all the same, everybody, when they encounter the Dhamma and the discipline, they can practice from any clan, from any kind of, I would say, you can extend that to anything, right? Any human being with their faculties intact who are capable of hearing the Dhamma and understanding the Dhamma have the opportunity when they hear that Dhamma to develop these things. And they are the proper ascetics. Um, of course, here it is talking about ascetics in the sense of uh, renunciates. But you can still be, um, yeah, you can still basically be a saint, right? If you want to use Christian, Christian language. Um, even as a householder, even as a householder, there's hope for you all. <laughs> I didn't really mean it that way, but yeah, just that it's incredibly inclusive. So, yeah, this is really beautiful, encouraging teaching, isn't it? Yeah. So we have to encounter the Dhamma and the Vinaya here. It's uh, an extension of the Dhamma. Sometimes, actually, I read something really nice uh, recently that explained the importance of the Vinaya more clearly to me, because sometimes it has come to mean discipline. But actually, in the beginning, the word Vinaya actually meant the application of the Dhamma. It wasn't limited just to the rules of the Patimoka or the training rules. It was actually the application of Dhamma. So that's why Dhamma Vinaya, actually, people say Vinaya is Vinaya. Um, the Dhamma in Vinaya is kind of like the Dhamma in its application, the Dhamma in its practice, which I think is much broader and more beautiful. So we have to encounter it. We have to actually practice it and then develop these things, developing loving kindness, compassion, mudita, altruistic joy, and equanimity, then they're practicing properly. So that's a bona fide path, right? And I like how it's uh, stated this way, that first it's the practice of the Brahma Viharas, and then we take it even further by realizing with direct knowledge, we enter upon liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom. Yeah, and we actually remove these asawas, which are basically... Um, you could call them influxes. You could also call them outflowings, a Jim Brown's preferred translation. Basically, the things that come in and stain or pollute uh, the mind, the defilements, really, of greed, hate, and delusion. Um, and then because of that, we're a true ascetic. So it's gradual again. But I'd like to think that this sort of shows a, a possible path through those developments of the Brahma Viharas, because they are also equivalent to the four jhanas and overcome uh, many of the, the defilements of the mind. Loving kindness, of course, specifically for ill will. And then compassion is a very beautiful way to overcome, um, I think, judgment, you know, judgment of others. Instead of judging, we have compassion, understanding that, you know, just as they suffer, um, we also might be suffering at any particular time. It's, it's, um, dependently arisen if we were in their situation we too might behave that way or might suffer that way and then the altruistic joy which is a way to remove resentment to remove jealousy um, that stinginess of mind and of course the equanimity which is able to be at peace with the world and with our life and experience and others of course the way it is understanding that we're all um subject to the laws of karma, cause and effect again. And we can help others. We can have this loving kindness. We can have the compassion and rejoice in people's success. But ultimately, 
Um, we can't change things for others. You know, they will actually meet the results of their own karma. So we can create, if you like, a really loving container, which maybe supports them in their life. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's at the societal level. But obviously, at a deeper level in the mind, we can develop these as deep states of samadhi. And that samadhi um, makes the mind clear enough to start to see the truth and to see with wisdom into um, where we suffer and how we can be freed. So that's really lovely, isn't it? That that's the whole purpose of the holy life. And we always say at the ordination, you know, may you give me the going forth for the sake of the realization of Nibbana, not for the sake of any kind of accolade or reward or respect, you know, that may come in due course. But, you know, a person that's really humble and that's really developed will never let that go to the head. <laughs> uh, Sajjan Bram always says it's uh, kind of ironic. There seems to be some kind of safeguard in the Dhamma, safeguard mechanism, whereby the more you disappear, the more respect you get. So it doesn't actually uh, impact you negatively because sometimes the praise can really um, corrupt a person's mind. But actually, if it's praise given for depth in meditation and for wisdom, it doesn't because there's less of you there to receive the praise. Um, anyway, I've spoken a lot and it would be really nice to have some more interaction just before we finish today. There's still 10 minutes or so to have uh, some discussion around this. So please do contribute any thoughts or. Yes. Yeah. Edwin. Edwin, can you unmute, please? Thank you. Thank you, Aya. And, um... Yeah, I I still have this sort of lingering question about something about uh, being a patient, um, because um, I've been ill for about thirty years, and um, it gets a little um, annoying being in that role <laughs> mm. after a while. Like I went from being a young person, vi young vibrant hiking person, to a patient, and. Um, it, so it gets very tiresome. And um, I think I find like, um, I think uh, Venerable Lupica said something about what was talking about, um, uh, uh, what was it? Um, sorry, I lose track sometimes. That's okay. but, was this today uh, about the patient and treating our minds the way we treat a patient? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, yeah, and I am the patient, you know? Right, right. And, um, uh, and so, and I find myself being reluctant a lot. And um, I don't know that I'm a very good patient. And, um, and I think that I, um, you know, I sort of fall into um, not doing anything about no, I can't say that. That's not true. I do a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to backtrack on that. Good. I do a lot, but there are things that I know are important at, that I just sort of fail at sometimes. Yeah. And, and sometimes I'll fail for long periods of time. Like I was forgetting to take my supplements mm -hmm. and, and actually hearing uh, venerable say that I was like, I'm getting my pill box out and I'm going to take them right now Yay. here. <laughs> So, you know, um, but I just wonder like about how to, how to manage that. Like, right. is there a way that you would suggest? Yeah. Um, well, I think the first way, thank you for sharing that. I'm so sorry to hear that you've been suffering for so long with this. And I think my goodness, if that's been going on, you know, 20 years, did you say 30 years? 30 years I mean that would test anybody's patient it's really different it's really difficult I mean I don't have your experience quite but I do have it to some degree it's about 18 years for me since my energy levels dropped significantly with chronic gastric condition and um, it's difficult because you know how you used to be and you know that your energy is far lower now and you just kind of somehow normalize it somehow but it's never the same as the people around you you know um, and that's really difficult because there will be some grief around that. Um, but I think in some ways you sort of uh, pointed to an, one answer 
And also um, just to draw again on, on the simile that Venerable Pekka shared, um, I think the point there is being a patient to your mind, being patient, treating the mind like you would treat a patient. So it's not beating yourself up when you don't take your medicine, you know, it's not beating yourself up when you get impatient or resentful or, or you grieve about your situation. It's, it's, you know, you wouldn't do that with an, another patient. You wouldn't say, well, come on, cheer up for goodness sake. What's wrong with you? You, know, you should be happy all the time. You wouldn't say that. You'd say, gosh, it must be hard for you. You know, I can't imagine what you're going through, but you know, just relax. You're doing really well. You know, you took your, pe- your medicine a few months ago. I'm sure you can start taking it again today. So that's one thing I think is, you know, to te- care for your mind, care for the reactions that you have um, that might be a little bit too hard and demanding on yourself. Because uh, I really think the patience involved in, in bearing with a chronic condition is immense already. And the results will pay, you know, you'll see the results um, as the aging process really starts to kick in because other people have often the conceit of youth the conceit of health, you know, the Buddha talked about these two as conceits. We don't really realize how fortunate we are to be healthy. We think, well, that's just me, you know, sick people, maybe there's something wrong with their attitude or whatever. So we have this conceit, but you don't have that. So this is already going to help enormously when it comes to later on in the life. But the other thing I think was um, that you probably do do a lot that's really positive. And the mind has a tendency to notice when we don't do something right. So what about all those things you do do every day that are actually good for you? <laughs> you know, maybe preparing a good meal or taking the rest that you need or just acknowledging your limitations, your energy levels, etc. The times that you do take medicine because you weren't taking it anyway. <laughs> so when you get it, then, yes, I took it today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but we always tend to notice when we don't do things right and, and we're too hard on ourselves. So, yeah, maybe using that patient analogy to think, well, would I really blame another person? Because we're far harder on ourselves. Especially it's hard when we're the ones looking after ourselves all the time. That's like, oh, you just want someone else to do it sometimes and remind you and put your medicine in front of you. you know. So, you know, you're doing pretty well, I think. So try and see the positives, what you do do rather than what you don't. That's one way. Yeah. And a lot of self-compassion as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anything else from the group? From anyone who hasn't spoken or shared or would like to contribute? Nothing? Okay. So someone else is asking about medical requirements for becoming a bhikkhuni or for taking bhikkhuni ordination. (laughs) Uh, I have a difficult medical history and I'm anxious about wanting to ordain. Well, firstly, I would say that there is no such thing as just ordaining as a bhikkhuni because it's a huge training and it takes a long time. It's a process. It involves coming to stay in a monastery, getting to know the community, uh, getting to know what monastic life's about, this can take already a long time. And then one would begin as an anagarika, which is eight precepts, um, which hopefully you're able to do. I mean, if somebody has a chronic gastric condition from the start, it's a bit more tricky because it's good to be able to start on the right foot and to be strong enough to undertake the initial training. But it's not absolutely essential. Um, other medical conditions, I mean, you get to know the community, you get to um see where it may be difficult and maybe monastic life wouldn't be that suitable or it might worsen the condition maybe it wouldn't so you get to see that for yourself um and it also depends on the community how mature the community is how much support there is um you know in the case of a new community which is just beginning uh it's very very helpful if i would have people it'd be essential that a have some stamina to serve and to be able to um, help the establishment of the of the monastery Um, because you know I'm already overworked I'm already not 100% well and uh, having other people to care for when you know medically for example when you're already overworked and struggling and med- and not so well is just not realistic so it has to work for the whole community but I would say you know 
there's there's a few communities now there's a few bikuni communities and it's never just a decision based on one aspect of what you bring you know you may have strengths in other ways um there may be communities that can support you really well there may be others where it's difficult so um i would begin the exploration uh don't don't rule anything out um but yeah just be open-minded and realistic that it may be a path for you but it you know, if it's not, that's fine as well. I think everybody that even starts the exploration takes a few steps further. This is my feeling to, to liberation, because you're actually really challenging this uh, underlying most strong defilement, if you like. I don't like the word defilement, but strongest tendency of wanting in the mind. Renouncing is going directly against that, and it's hugely beneficial in the practice. It's essential actually but there's many ways to do that not only by ordaining um there are many ways to do that so see it as a process and see every step on that process even just the initial exploration as uh hopefully benefiting your practice so i mean for myself and i don't necessarily say this is a good thing but <laughs> it was a, a situational thing it took me 10 years to uh, find a place to ordain and that was knowing that that's what I wanted to do the rest of my life, having already been meditating very um, sincerely and fairly intensively and giving a lot of service over 10 years. And I don't regret any moment of that because it was all really, really strong preparation for what was to come. So, yeah. So, yeah. Don't be too fixated on the goal, but just go through the process and see, see how you grow. Okay. So last uh, comment here. Thanks for sharing that. This is the person who shared about their health condition. That's amazing. Having lived with something for 30 years, feeling much better for you. You obviously have great intentions and are trying. Just being at a sort of class proves that. <laughs> I think you should copy and paste that comment. Uh, Jim Graham always tells me, you know, if you get some encouragement or some someone expresses gratitude, copy, paste it, keep it somewhere. <laughs> Because we don't see how strong we are. We don't see what we give to others and how we inspire. So, wow, so beautiful, isn't it? That by sharing our struggles, we we really inspire others as well. Yeah. <laughs> and someone else is backing that too, including me and I'm sure everyone else here too. So thank you so much. I think we're almost uh, coming to a close. And I think normally one of our co-host teams say a few words on Dana to end. So if you can just stay, stick about for another few minutes and then we'll let you know what's happening with the next teachings. Okay. Yeah, so as you know, today's Sutta discussion is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. Uh, so that is what the dana is about. Uh, any contribution you are able to make is gratefully received and it will help to improve our new Vihara in Oxford and day-to-day -day running of it and development of England's first monastery where women can train towards full bhikkhuni ordination. As Venerable told now, um, there's um, aspired bhikkhunis in the future maybe coming and checking and uh, you know how this life is and is it for me and uh, there, there's a lot of things that a vihara like this gives uh, and also teachings for people like uh, us all here um so if you are able to donate um we will put a link in the chat box and if you also if you are capable you can provide a food dana uh, to venerables uh, uh, by visiting the Vihara. And uh, you can contact team at anukampaproject.org for more details. And they will send you uh, a calendar with, um, uh, there is a calendar in the uh, website as well um, uh, for uh, Dana needing days. And also, there are several more ways to get involved by getting into a couple of WhatsApp groups to provide food when there's no bookings made or if you want to volunteer if you have any expertise any one-off work in vihara um, or weekly 
supermarket delivery. There are several ways of doing that. And if you have any strengths and if you feel like you can do some volunteering, you have some quality time to um, give as Dana. Um, that also is very much appreciated. Um, so contact team at anukampa.org uh, if you if you can go one step uh, more in this community. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I brought everybody who's in the room here to say goodbye because <laughs> they're just the sweetest people you ever can meet. Anyway, <laughs> Bernard Blupek is very much here and will be with you for the next couple of weeks while I'm away in Norway teaching for Den Norsk, Buddhist for something. I can't read the rest of it. <laughs> but basically, the Norwegian Buddhist Association is a very great name for the first monastery or foundation in Norway to develop a monastery that supports bikunis as well. So I'll be teaching there and seeing some of you. I know Erica's coming. Unfortunately, um, Ellen can't come, but anyway, some of you can. And uh, yeah, this is Paul and Richard, our wonderful host. They're actually giving us this house, which is their house to live in while they go and stay in an Airbnb. It's like amazingly generous. So me and Venable Opeka can have like this holiday in honestly, the most idyllic, one of the most idyllic parts of the country in Lancashire. So um, we're really appreciating it. And yeah, they've been serving us so beautifully, so beautifully. And it just gives me the feeling of like, what this is about, you know, because it's not about any one bikuni or even only bikunis, right? It's about the whole community. Um, and yeah, I'm so proud, proud in the sense I didn't do it, but pleased and grateful that this is such an inclusive place. So um, yeah, and Paul, I don't know if you know, everybody knows Paul, but he's like our Facebook coordinator. And he's like one of our most devoted volunteers since the very, very beginning, like 2016, um, and has done just such incredible selfless service to bring in so many people into the Dhamma, also many donations through Facebook, and, you know, just a huge amount without ever, I don't know, just so humbly and so selflessly, you know. Anyway, I want to say that, actually, because he probably doesn't really get that sort of, yeah, appreciation in public, and I think we all owe him a great deal, so, yeah. Anyway, all of you here have been supporting in so many ways and um, I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, the, every every session will carry on as usual, I think. Um, yeah, Venerable Pekka will do the chanting on a Wednesday. There'll be the weekly meditations with Matthias. And uh, yeah, and for those who don't know, Ajahn Brahmali is here in May. You need to book because at this point, it's not long to go. Tell your friends. There's one talk with both of me and Venerable Pekka. And Ajahn Brahmali, and we don't have many people coming, which is depressing. So please come so that we don't have to feel depressed. That's not fair, is it? Because it's up to us to handle it. But but I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it'll be really interesting. It's about um gender in Buddhism. And you know, it's interesting to hear from people who aren't in the privileged section, or not such a privileged section, anyways um yeah the talks are probably not all live streamed it's a bit of a, a job you know for us to find more volunteers to do this and then I have to say to my volunteers you can't come to the talk you've got to live stream it's it's a little bit too much I'm organizing this mostly on my own at the moment so I'm not sure I think on the 23rd there's a day retreat by London but it's no London Insight and they'll be recording that live but we record everything on video you can wait a week or whatever, and the miraculous Matthias will put it on YouTube. Or Paul, here he is again. Paul also. Paul and Matthias are our dream team who upload stuff to YouTube in no time at all, so everything is freely shared. Um, I understand that Diana can't come all the way from California, so fair enough, you're off the hook. <laughs> and the other thing to share is that Venerable Upeka and I will teach a little day retreat in Cambridge on June the 17th. So that's coming up in a newsletter in the next few weeks. All right. So I think you're very patient to stay this long and we see you very soon. Take care, everybody. We can unmute you if you want. You can wave goodbye. We wave goodbye. We all bye wave bye. goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.